Dear viewers, good day to you. My guest today is a former Minnesota lawmaker, politician, and a member of Minnesota House of Representatives. She is also the author of the Fix What You Can, Schizophrenia and Lawmakers Fight for Her Son. This book is a brand, frank account from a mother who was a state legislator when her son Jim's first delusion demanded he kill her. But after he made a serious suicide attempt, she realizes he is the one in danger. Her seat at a table allowed her to work to change policies that barred her from saving her son's life. It's impressive career, but also impressive life story. My guest is Mindy Grayley. I have to ask you for the beginning, how are you in this pandemic time? <laughs> Well, thank you, Amra, for having me on. I think this is a very important uh, program and we're doing great. Um, one thing that came out of the pandemic was telehealth. Jim, our son who has schizophrenia had been seeing his medical professionals in person, but once the COVID started, he had to do everything by Zoom. And we realized we didn't have to stick with local professionals. So now he has an incredible nationally um, famous psychiatrist who's in another state, New York. So that was actually a good thing for us to come out of COVID. Know you better. Can you tell me how your story began that led you to become a politician in the Minnesota House of Representatives? Well, I joined a group that is called the League of Women Voters in the United States, and it started after women got the right to vote in with the 19th Amendment. And these had been the same women who had been suffragists advocating for the women's right to vote. So they thought once women did have that right, they should um, not just vote how their husbands told them, they should think for themselves. So they wanted to educate women on the issues. So I joined that group here in my local area and got interested in attending political meetings, school board, city council, state legislature. And then I was recruited by one of my friends in the League of Women Voters who was on the local school board. So I did that for a couple of terms and then I was recruited to the state legislature. So when I got involved, I always was careful to recruit other women, realizing that often men come forward for political office and women are more reticent. They don't think they're ready or they don't know enough or maybe somebody else should do it. And so, um, so I was always recruited. I never would have gotten into politics without the League of Women Voters, strong women pushing me forward. So I try, tried to do that for, for other women as well because um, even today, young women like yourself, we still find they need an extra push compared to men. I totally agree with that. Uh, it's the same situation here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we are trying to deal that situation on a daily basis. But um, you have said earlier that it's important to give a woman more encouragement to run, and you repeated in a former question. What, in your experience, has been proven to be an effective way of encouraging a woman to run? Women don't like to do things by themselves. They need lots of people supporting them and lots of help. So I actually gave this advice to men and women who I was recruiting, but women are the ones who actually often did it. And that is don't decide to run until you have your helpers. So you need a treasurer, someone to collect up the money and put it in the bank and get the thank yous ready. You need a volunteer coordinator who will recruit people to go door knocking with you, who will help get your mailings ready, who will do your social media. You need um, someone to um, head up doing your social media. You need all these things you need. Get those people in place because usually these are people that want you to run. So ask them before you say for sure you'll do it. So I always called people up and said, I'm thinking of running. People are encouraging me to run, but I can only do it if I have help. So will you do this? And if you don't want to do that, do you want to do anything? And um, if people had told me no for that, all those things, I might not have run. But every single person I ever asked pr pretty much always said yes. 
And so that's why I decided to run. So I tell women to do that. And then they feel comforted, shorn up, um, empowered, and that they're not alone in the race. Because races can be tough, especially nowadays with all the negative campaigning. Uh, usually I see women who women who are like always thinking about are they ready to go in politics to enter the politics are we ever ready or we should try bold be bold and just try even if we don't think that we have everything prepared and that we know everything definitely just jump in because we're never ready you're right we're always learning. If we're lucky, we're lifelong learners. I'm always reading books and listening to documentaries or podcasts and things, and we are never done learning. But the best place to learn is being in elected office. So when you're on the school board, you can talk every day if you want to the school superintendent. You've got all the heads of all the departments. If there's an issue coming up about how to manage busing and getting kids to and from school, or what's the best curriculum for reading or math. You have people right there to ask in your school district and or in your school board organizations or all the education groups in the legislature. Um, you can summon anyone from the University of Minnesota or National people can be flown in and then you, because they want to tell the policymakers their side of the story or what their recommendations are. So they all fawn all over you and give you information and try to persuade you. So you don't need to be ready at all. Um, I came from the League of Women Voters, as I said, where we studied issues to death <laughs> because we just thought we always needed to know more. But yet, when I ran for the legislature, everybody said, forget about the issues, you know, just get in there and then you can do it. That We still live in a predominantly male world. Um, in my country, it's so discouraging that even women doesn't want to vote for a woman because under the pretext that men are longer in politics, they know better, et cetera, et cetera. But how can we change such deeply rooted attitudes? What can we do to change those things? I think success breeds success. So we, those of us who do support more women in office need to keep doing that, putting them forward. The more role models we have, the more apt we are to have more role models. There's research that shows that women, even though they're reticent to run for office, when they do, they have an equal or better chance of being elected than men. So they just have to be encouraged and be bold, as you said, to put their hat in the ring and run, and then they will win. But it's when they don't run that we don't have the numbers of women in office that we should. The higher up the food chain we go, the more criticism I think there is of women. You know, we think um, governors and presidents and people that are in the high level positions need to be really strong. It's really good to have a male voice and a strong man or something like that. So those are the places where it's even harder, I think, to get women to run or um, to, to succeed. But that's, again, if women do, do run, do get their head in the ring, then they have a good chance, just as good as men, to get elected. And they can do, we know women, study and work hard and by and large, you know, do really well. So I think more role models. And so we have in the United States, um, something called Women Winning, or we have Emily's List, you know, groups that specifically raise money for women and promote them and help them get endorsed and help them get elected. Because that's the one area where women don't have as good of an opportunity as men, and that's raising money, raising the big bucks. Men um, you know, have their networks and tend to have more colleagues and comrades who are earning more money than women. We still have the gender gap in employment as well. And therefore, um, women need help raising money. So we could, more women to get elected and help them with money, I think would be two 
two ways to improve things. Mindy, you have written a book called Fix What You Can, Schizophrenia and Lawmakers Fight for Her Son. Uh, you wrote about what happened after your son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, what are you still working to achieve through political engagement? Um, no. How challenging was it to uh, fully expose your truth? How did you um, deal with your private, but also a public uh, situation at the same time? That was a luxury actually for me to be a legislator when Jim got sick. He was 21. He was, I had been in the legislature for six years and then I had 14 more years in the legislature after he got sick. So um, I was already a public figure both our kids and my husband, all of our family was used to being talked about by me in, um, as examples you know, when I was on the school board in the legislature. So it was a natural progression then when Jim got sick for me to keep talking about our family. And when the newspapers then, the newspapers and television and radio, when they find out a legislator has a personal story, that's a good story for them. They might not cover the issue at all, especially something like mental illness back when Jim got sick in 1999. Um, they might not cover it if it was somebody begging to share their story. But when it's a public elected official, then you have an opportunity and I think an obligation to, you know, to share. So, um, so even though it was very hard because it's you're in personal distress, it still was a luxury. And every time our family ran into a trouble, you know, like the hospital wouldn't um, talk to us because they didn't ask Jim about a medical release for information, or the police wouldn't take Jim to the hospital, even though he was very sick and out of control. I could make a big fuss and people were kind of afraid of me for fear they wouldn't do a good job and what would I say and what would end up in the public and would their name be there. And so if ever Jim wasn't getting good care or the hospital was gonna release him before I thought he was ready, if I could say, okay, who is releasing him? Who made that decision? I would like to know. So when he is let, go without being properly stabilized, who, um, I want to know who made that decision. And then often they would let him stay, you know, because they, they didn't want to be the one that didn't um, properly take care of Representative Greiling's son. Um, so that gave me power and I felt I should use it then for other people. So right away, the first legislation I ever passed was the first problem we ran into. They wouldn't talk to me because Jim hadn't signed a release of information. And in truth, they hadn't asked him to sign one. They didn't uh, think it was their job to ask him because he was in quite a bit of distress and psychotic and when he went to the hospital, but they didn't ask him and they didn't tell me that's why they couldn't talk to me. They just said, we can't talk to you. And um, so I looked into it with the lawyers at the legislature, and we just wrote a simple bill that said hospitals have to explain to families about the need for signing releases, and they have to encourage the person in the hospital to sign one. And if they're too sick to pay attention, they keep asking them as they get better on medication or with help, and then eventually um, they will sign it. So I thought that was just common sense, but um, that is often what laws are. They're policy, they're just common sense written down that people aren't using their common sense about. So all things like that, um, I felt, and it also made me feel better. You know, advocacy is the last stage of grief and you, know, you go through um, denial and anger. I was angry quite a bit at the time, but then simultaneously I could advocate and that made me feel better. And we ended up with uh, a better mental health system, I think, because of it. I have to know, after 20 years of legislature, what are the results that makes you most proud of? Well, I 
would have been mostly proud of this huge education finance reform that I developed working with all the education groups in the state, and they all eventually agreed upon it. We have different areas of the state that need different types of funding, and they always fought amongst each other. But then um, we had this plan that would have, they all supported that would have been fair to everybody. That would have been my crowning achievement, <laughs> but I could, we didn't get it passed in the end. Um, we passed it um, in the House of Representatives where I served, and I think the governor would have signed it, but the Senate rural uh, Democrats, actually, my own party, uh, killed it because they were fearful that they were doing better under the old system where they'd been at, able to advocate for certain uh, special things in the education finance bill. So that didn't end up passing and that's that was my biggest regret. What I'm most proud of is my mental health legislation. We did end up with a hugely um, better funded mental health system, a much more um, robust amount of services and did a lot of policy improvements. So that is, I think, um, what I most remembered for, even though I spent most of my time working on education. Since we are uh, going to the end of this conversation, I have to ask you also, how does everyday life of a wife, sister, mother, daughter play an important role in a political action? What, how you see that? Well, I think that um, women are good at multitasking. So I think it's a natural thing. We can weave everything in. Um, sometimes mothers bring babies to the house floor if they fell short on a babysitter. And we can um, we learn to be on the phone about one thing, writing something else and doing our social media, all those things. I just think... Um, it enhances all the relationships in your life. You don't have as much time. I'll always regret that I didn't notice Jim getting sick, you know, when he was in high school, as much as I think I would have if I hadn't been so busy being a legislator. But as I said later, it was to great advantage when I, when he did get floridly sick that I could help in the legislature. But my family's always been proud of me. Um, our daughter, like you, is a journalist, and she got interested in public policy, but was smart enough not to get into the fray herself. She's covering it. She works for Politico, if you're familiar with that organization. And um, so I think it really helped everybody. Jim, our son, helped me write the book. And a lot of parents that I know and mothers and fathers would like to write about their children with schizophrenia or some sort of mental illness, but the, the family member doesn't want them to. They've gotten used to this culture of keeping it quiet, that it's a shameful thing. And they, then, they, then no one can speak about it and it just kind of compounds your sadness and your grief. But when you, so Jim though, was used to me, you know, telling tales about, you know, why didn't he get on the ski team when he was in high school? I talked about that at the, at the school board meeting or you know, talking in the legislature, I did a lot of talking about my granddaughter eventually. And so I wrote a blog about her recently and put on my book webpage about hoping she won't use marijuana because that's actually a cause of psychosis and earlier schizophrenia. So everybody um, I think benefits when, when you talk publicly and my always talking publicly helped my family and helped me to write the book and helped my son to participate. Yeah. yeah. To finish in the spirit of the title, or at least part of the title of your book, uh, what can we fix when it comes to the relationship of woman to politics? What is your advice for a woman who are watching this anywhere from Bosnia to Minnesota? Uh, and they are thinking about running for the office, but they are not decided yet. Well, I would just say jump in and get involved. Go to your any low level political meetings, network with everyone you know. When you first, I always told first time candidates, when you are first running, you do have to raise money and you do need helpers. So make a database of every single person you think might 
possibly help you and put down the long shots too, because sometimes the ones you know best don't come through and the ones you barely thought you should put on the list come through big time. So network, get involved at the lower levels, you know, pay attention, get to know the movers and shakers, and then just always look for opportunities. Don't get discouraged if you don't win the first time. Run again. I served with a wonderful person who almost became the Minnesota governor, and she had to run three times the first time she ran to even get elected. And then she was very successful. So be persistent, network, and look for every opportunity and jump in before a man does. 